and welcome to Homotopia. Um, and please join me in welcoming the uh, recently voted Writer of the Decade by Stonewall, Sarah Waters. Thank you. Pleasure. Hello. Sorry, let me just do this and then I won't have to do it again. Perhaps I should have introduced myself. Um, <laughs> I'm Lou uh, and I work for Homotopia. Um, so to start off with, um, I think Sarah's going to read a bit from the book to give us some context for yeah. what we're going to talk about. Can I do that? that? Okay, yes, so I'm going to read it. This is the Pain Guest. This is my, well, it's not that new anymore, is it? No. We were saying it's been, it was out last August, so it's just over a year old. Um, yeah, so we thought it might make sense if I, if I read a little bit. Um, and I'm going to read from really early on, so it will kind of um, contextualise things too. So the Pain Guest is set in 1922, and it's set mainly uh, in a house in South London, a bit of London called Champion Hill in Camberwell which even today is quite a genteel bit of South London, and it was especially so in the 1920s, but it was kind of under threat by kind of more <laughs> working-class housing, or lower-middle-class housing, really, that was kind of creeping up the hill towards it. The residents there were a bit of a kind of island of solidly middle-class and upper-middle-class life. Um, and here I've, Im I've imagined a house, um, a kind of substantial suburban house, with, with two women living in it, Mrs Ray, who's um, a widow who's lost her sons to the First World War, and her daughter Frances, who's in her 20s, unmarried, on her way to becoming a spinster, although, as we discover later, she has a slightly interesting past. Um, Frances and her mother, like lots of middle-class people in this period, they've lost money, <coughs> they've lost income, and they've lost servants, and they've been obliged to bring in lodgers, and they are the paying guests of the title. They're uh, the Barbers, Mr and Mrs Barber, Leonard and Lillian, a young married couple, of the Clark class, as it was rather snootily known in, the, in, the, in this day. It was uh, you know, the lower middle class um, couple. Um, so they've moved in on the Sunday. Frances has watched appalled as their gaudy Clark class furniture has been brought into the house. There's been awkwardnesses on the stairs and the landing and that sort of thing. Frances has found Mrs Barber, however, to be unexpectedly rather nice. And now it's the Monday morning. Um, Mr. Bob has gone to work, Frances's mother has gone out, and Frances has been doing some housework. She's been washing the hall floor. Mrs. Barber has appeared on the stairs in her nightgown and kimono to ask if she can have a bath. Um, Frances tells her that she and her mother have, have forgotten to light the hot water geezer, so she offers to light it for her, holds out a hand to help Mrs. Barber <coughs> cross the wet hall floor. Mrs. Barber was on the bottom stair now and clearly doubtful about where to step to. After the slightest of hesitations, she took the hand that Frances offered, braced herself against her grip, then made the small spring forward to the unwashed side of the floor. Her kimono parted as she landed, expo exposing more of her <coughs> nightdress and giving an alarming suggestion of the rounded, mobile, unsupported flesh inside. They went together through the kitchen and into the scullery. The bath was in there, beside the sink. It had a bleached wooden cover used by Frances as a draining board, with a practiced movement, she lifted this free and set it against the wall. The tub was an ancient one that had been several times re-enamelled, most recently by Frances herself, who was not quite sure of the result. The iron struck her today, especially, as having a faintly leprous appearance. The Vulcan geyser was also rather <coughs> frightful, a greenish riveted cylinder on three bowed legs. It must have been the top of its manufacturer's range in about 1870, but now looked like the sort of vessel in which someone in a Jules Verne novel might make a trip to the moon. It has a bit of a temperament, I'm afraid, she told Mrs Barber. You have to turn this tap, but not this one. You might blow us sky high if you do. The flame goes here. She struck a match. Best to look the other way at this point. My father lost both his eyebrows doing this once. There. The flame, with a whoosh, had found the gas. The cylinder began to tick and rattle. Excuse me. She frowned at it, her hands at her hips. What a beast it is. I am sorry, Mrs Barber. She gazed right round the room at the stone sink, the copper in the corner, the mortuary tiles on the wall. I do wish this house was more up to date for you, she said. 
But Mrs. Barber shook her head. Oh, please don't wish that. She tucked back a curl of hair. Francis noticed the piercing for her earring, a little dimple in the lobe. I like the house just as it is, she said. It's a house with a history, isn't it? Things, well, they oughtn't always to be modern. There'd be no character if they were. And there it was again, thought Francis, that niceness, that kindness, that touch of delicacy. She answered with a laugh, well, as far as character goes, I fear this house might be rather too much of a good thing, but I'm glad you like it. I like it too, though I'm apt to forget that. Now, we oughtn't to let this geezer get hot without running some water, or there'll be no house left to like and no us to do the liking. Do you think you can manage? If the flame goes out, give me a call. Mrs. Barber smiled, showing neat white teeth. I will. Thank you, Miss Ray. Frances left her to it and returned to her wet floor. The scullery door was closed behind her and quietly bolted. But the door between the kitchen and the passage was propped open, and as Frances retrieved her cloth, she could hear very clearly Mrs. Barber's preparations for her bath, the rattle of the chain against the tub, followed by the splutter and gush of the water. The gushing, it seemed to her, went on for a long time. She had told a fib about her and her mother's use of the geyser. It was too expensive to light often. They drew their hot water from the boiler in the old-fashioned stove. They bathed at most once a week, frequently taking turns with the same bath water. If Mrs. Barber were to want baths like this on a daily basis, their gas bill might double. But at last the flow was cut off. There came the splash of water and the rub of heels as Mrs. Barber stepped into the tub, followed by a more substantial liquid thwack as she lowered herself down. After that, there was a silence, broken only by the occasional echoey plink of drips from the tap. Like the parted kimono, the sounds were unsettling. The silence was most unsettling of all. Sitting at her bureau a short time before, Frances had been picturing her lodgers in purely mercenary terms as something like two great waddling shillings. But this, she thought, shuffling backward over the tiles, this was what it really meant to have lodgers, this odd, unintimate proximity, this rather peeled back moment where the only thing between herself and a naked Mrs Barber was a few feet of kitchen and a thin scullery door. An image sprang into her head, that round flesh crimsoning in the heat. She adjusted her pose on the mat, took hold of her cloth, and rubbed hard at the floor. Thanks. That's an absolutely brilliant passage to read in terms of just um, summing up so many of the aspects of, of your writing and, and this novel, because... Um, there's so much characterization drip fed through that. There's so much sensuality and the hints of thing, things to come in it too. Um, I particularly, I mean, the, the, the issues of class and, mm. and uh, gender, the, uh, there was one, the, the quote that I really enjoyed was the, um, it was as if a giant moth had sucked a bag of boiled sweets and then given the house a lick. <laughs> Which I think really a giant you. moth, did you say? A giant. A giant That's, moth. No, that, I'm just picturing like some sort of Jap <laughs> Japanese monster flick or something. A giant moth is really so much better actually than I actually like. <laughs> 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 That's actually me not writing really no, my own no. yeah, But I, I did, I mean, that line Thank in you. terms of trying to, you know, the characterisation of, of, uh, of Lillian, of this slightly vulgar crush. <laughs> oh. Well, only, we only said it because she's wearing a kimono <laughs> at 10 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> um, well, yeah, I mean, yeah, characterisation. It's a difficult thing to get a handle on, I find. You know, sort of people who are just starting off writing or creative writing students, they often ask me for tips about characterisation, and I find it the hardest thing to e even theorise, really. Um, plot, you know, I can get my head around a plot... Um, atmosphere, I feel like I can go about evoking atmosphere. But yeah, I mean, characterisation is absolutely key. We really want and need to, to care about the characters in a, in a work of fiction, don't we, whether it's a novel or a film or whatever. And uh, get, getting your readers to care about your characters or to believe in your characters. And I, read, um, I read somewhere tricky. I think that you weren't particularly <coughs> fond of, was it Francis or Lillian, that you didn't... Well, they took a long time, I think, to come into focus for me. What happened was, I mean, The Paying Guests is 
it's kind of a crime at the heart of the paying guests, and so we could talk about that maybe in a bit. But um, when I started it, I knew that I'm not. This is a book. It's impossible to talk about without giving things away. But I'm not. I mean, <laughs> the moment Lillian appears in her kimono, it's not difficult to guess where things are going. So I'm not giving too much away <laughs> to say that Francis and Lillian they well, they have an affair, basically. Um, and when I first planned the book, and for the first year or two of working on it, I was really interested in, well, really in kind of love as an illusion. You know, I think people often have affairs. It seems like you're, obs you know, you fall in love with this, this person comes into your life by accident and you can't help yourself. You fall in love with them. You have to have an affair. But I think affairs are often, you know, used really as a way of get, getting out of the relationship you're in or teaching your partner a lesson or proving something to yourself. And often I think we have a kind of affair shaped holes in our lives already, you know, for somebody to step into almost. And I was really interested in that, in how Francis and Lillian would, would seem to fall in love and it would be kind of incredibly hectic and then this terrible thing would happen and their love would sort of crumble away. And I started to write it like that and Lillian, um, I wasn't sure about Lillian's motives, you know, I wasn't sure what, what Lillian was up to really. She was slightly coquettish, she was slightly unknowable and I just didn't really like it it just wasn't I realized it made for a rather bleak reading ultimately and so anyway I remember having a conversation with my agent about halfway through the writing process which for me you know I'm a slow writer so this was after two years of work and she'd seen the latest draft and she said okay she said I see this as um, a crime story that's complicated by love and it was only in her saying that I thought, you know what, this should be a love story that's complicated by a crime. Right. And I thought, yeah, I want it to be actually a proper love story, which was very appealing to me. Because even though I've often had love and romance um, and desire and relationships in my previous novels, I'd never written what I thought, what I think of as a, as a proper romance, by which I mean, you know, we, we follow a couple as they fall in love. It's the vicissitudes of love and the, 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 you know, their relationship in peril and will they or won't they stay together. So that really appealed to me as an idea. Um, and it made me then go back and make the characters um, properly kind of decent, honest, true, in their very different ways, Francis and Lillian. You know, I think they're, they've got real integrity. And um, that was, I think that's when the novel got, came into focus for me and when the, the two characters came into focus for me too. I began to like them more. That's to answer your question. I, yeah, I got there in the end, kind of thing. <laughs> It's slightly frustrating because I don't, we're aware that we don't want to go into too much about later on in the book and give too much away, but actually that there is a point later on in the book where you doubt Lillian's motives, or Francis starts to doubt Lillian's <laughs> motives. Francis starts to. And I actually then started to believe that perhaps Lillian wasn't <coughs> as she had yeah. at first. Well, I like that because... Yeah, no, so yeah, yeah, well, good, good. Um, you know, because I, I sort of, what, I wanted to keep this original idea I had about Lillian being slightly tricksy and, you know, what was she up to? I wanted to keep just a little bit of that because the novel is told entirely from Francis's perspective. It's in the third person, but it's all in Francis's head and I loved the possibilities of that, you know, for a narrative. We, we can only ever see what Francis sees. We're trapped in, in her responses and thoughts. Um, we might not always agree with them, you know what I mean? But we can't, we never get in Lillian's head. So there is this core of unknowability to Lillian's motives and feelings. And in fact, the cent central incident, there is a kind of a core, a tiny bit of unknowability to that as well, what exactly has, has happened there. Um, and as I say, I like that because, you know, when we're in love or when we're having any kind of relationship with anybody, we might think we know them inside out. You know, we might think we've lived with, you know, we've lived them for 20 years. We know all their sort of bathroom habits and things. But there's always, there's always that bit of them that you can't know. And that, I think when things are going well, you take that in your stride. But if a relationship is put under pressure, it's very easy to become paranoid and anxious. And suddenly that unknowability mutates into all sorts of really scary things. Mm. And I suppose that happens a bit for Francis, I, yeah. Mm. That interesting because you've just touched on point of view, and that, that's something that lots of writers struggle with. Um, why did you decide to write this as third person and not as first person? Why is it not Francis's story? Yeah, I think that sort of thing happens really early on with a novel. Um, almost, it almost comes as a bit of a package once the novel begins to come to life for you. You sort of have an instinct about how it should be told. I don't know if I even seriously contemplated making it a first-person narrative. And I think, I, I think, 
I hadn't thought it through at the time, but I think the reason for that is I didn't want the reader to know that Francis would end up okay. Do you know what I mean? Because right. if it was Francis telling the story, then we, we would know she had survived in some way, right. she was doing all right, you know. Um, and that can be useful for some stories, but for this story, when Francis and Lillian become really imperiled in a really, you know, quite major way, I, I, wanted, I didn't want us to know that. In fact, I didn't quite know myself. Even though I, I'm happiest working when I do have a very clear vision of a book. Um, and I did sort of, I could see the skeleton of the plot for this novel from, from quite early on. But as I was really writing some of those scenes, I was, I was really worried about, about Francis. You know, I, just, I didn't know which way it yeah. was quite going to go, which way would end up feeling the best way to do it. So perhaps we should go back to talk about the, the, the <coughs> genesis of the, the story. And I've got a confession in that I, I bought the book when it came out, started reading it, but made the mistake of reading reviews. And, and, and they referred to the Rattenbury and Thompson cases. Mm. <coughs> and I had seen Fred and Edie on the telly mm. and thought, oh, I know what happens. And I stopped reading because I thought, I know what happens. That's really frustrating. Mm. And then returned to the book and thought, I don't know what happens at all. This isn't... So I wonder how, if you could talk a bit about those cases and how yeah. the genesis, but also how <coughs> was that a constraining thing because there were already these stories out there. There were already fictionalised accounts of the same, mm. the same cases. Well, um, yeah, I mean, just to backtrack a bit, what happened was I went to the 20s interested in the decade and really knowing not very much about it at all. And was reading, I always find reading novels a really good way into, into a period, into kind of the mind of a period. And I was reading Virginia Woolf and Aldous Huxley and D.H. Lawrence and not feeling, I wasn't finding the 20s that I was beginning to realise I wanted to find, by which I mean, you know, those novels, they're, they're great, but the characters are high society characters or they're very arty or bohemian yeah. or kind of extreme in some way. And I realised I wanted to know more about ordinary people, lower middle class people, suburban people, working class people. And um, I wasn't feeling a connection with them through those novels. So I began to think about how else I might find just bits of information. And I remembered, um, I thought about crime, because I knew from reading I'd done for other books, I suppose, that in the writing up of true crime cases, you often get really in interesting incidental details about people's lives, people's jobs their domestic habits. And I remembered a case from 1922, the Thompson and Bywaters case, one of the ones you're talking about, uh, featuring a woman called Edith Thompson, um, who was unhappily married, having an affair with a younger man, Freddie, and um, wrote him a series of passionate letters in which she talked about their love and talked really freely about the fact she'd got pregnant and had an abortion, and then she, f and she flirted with the idea of murdering her husband, perhaps by poisoning him. Every time she saw her God, it just seems just cr criminally stupid, really, or just sad that every time she saw a newspaper piece about somebody who got poisoned, <laughs> she'd cut it out and send it <laughs> to Freddie. And she asked him to destroy her letters, and she destroyed his letters to her, which I think were equally open and passionate. Anyway, eventually, after many months of this, Freddie, in a kind of jealous rage, he rushed up to Edith and her husband one night on the street and stabbed her husband to death and ran off and then the police caught him quite easily and of course he hadn't destroyed Edith's letters. The police found them, they looked dreadfully incriminating. They arrested her on a charge of incitement and they were both put on trial at the Old Bailey. Her letters were read out in court which just looked dreadfully, just dreadful and of course revealed her to be this very sexually active um, woman and anyway they were both found guilty and they were both hanged. And, um, it absolutely kind of electrified the nation, really, uh, you know, as a, as a story. And yeah. she was this figure that really kind of <coughs> attracted people, repelled people, but really kind of captivated the imagination. And then there was a, the other case you mentioned was the Rattenbury and Stoner case from a few years later in the 30s. Alma Rattenbury having an affair with a younger man who murdered her husband. So that she was put on trial. And actually largely because of unease about what had happened to Edith Thompson, she was, or partly because of that, she was found not guilty, but it was pretty clear that she wasn't guilty. But she was so, it had been such an ordeal for her, the whole thing, and the police were kind of, um, sorry, the press were kind of hounding her, that she, she committed suicide a few days after she was found innocent. She stabbed herself with a, with a knife in the heart. And so, you know, these two women, 
um, both ended up dead for murders they hadn't technically committed at all, especially in Alma's case. Um, and both really kind of demonised because they were seen to be these sexually active women. And yeah. So fascinating cases. Um, so although I'd gone to that sort of thing just, as I say, for incidental detail, I became really interested in that kind of crime, you know, a crime that isn't the work of madmen or psychopaths or serial killers or masterminds, you know, not, not really wicked people um, or disturbed people, but just kind of ordinary people who just make a mistake, I mean, a terrible mistake, you know, and then as a result of it, absolute nightmare. Um, and also I was interested in the... Um, <coughs> the heterosexuality of those crimes, that classic triangle of a wife, a husband, and a male lover. And I began to think, well, what would, you know, well, how would this have played out if the lover was a female rather than, uh, rather than male? And what would that do to, to the case, you know? And that, those, that was my starting point, really. So The Pain Guest isn't in any sense a retelling of Edith's stories or Alma Rattenbury's stories, but it's, it was definitely, um, you know, I felt it, I wanted it to be on the same <coughs> landscape um, but this very different, you know, it's a very different dynamic and has a, ha, there are very, very, very different repercussions for the people involved. Mm. But you, so the Rattenbury case was the 30, it was 35, I think, 34, 35. So was there ever a point where you thought you'd write about, set it in the 30s? Because you haven't done um, the 30s decades. I haven't done, done the 30s, yet, so. saving that one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, because I think I got interested in the 20s in particular, and uh, the early 20s which was, I realised, very close to the end of the war, of course, and I hadn't taken that on board when I first went to the decade. We think of decades, don't we, as being like these discrete lumps of time, and of course they vary enormously. And I think what, part of what interested me in the 20s what it was, it was that it was this time of rapid change, you know. Um, so coming out of the, the First World War, People took a long time, of course, to kind of grieve and pull themselves back together. Everybody was exhausted and everyone was having nervous breakdowns and things. And people were figuring out how to memorialise the dead and lay out the cemeteries and war memorials. And it took, I think it took a while for people to sort of change gear and start looking forwards. And then by the end of the 20s, life was really kind of picking up pace. Um, so that, you know, I'd, I'd written... Two previous novels with a post-war setting in the late set in the late forties, the, the Night Watch and the Little Stranger. So I'm very I don't know why, but I'm interested in that those eras that are kind of change of gear eras. I think it's because you know you've got some people in them who are who are not recovering. You know, lot, some people are in recovery; they've moved on, they're moving on, and then some people are stuck and aren't. And what does that feel like? You know, how does that play out? And I suppose what interest what. What I began to see about the 20s, I think, was it was partly a generational thing. I think young people um, came out of the war looking forwards. OK, we've had that, it's terrible, you know, but maybe Catherine Mansfield, for example, she writes to John Middleton Murray at one point. You know, she said nothing, basically she's saying nothing can ever be the same because of the war. We've got to write in new ways, and if we don't, we're betraying all the things that we went through, you know. But I think for older people, and Frances's mother who's in her 50s, only in her 50s, only a bit older than me, but is aged and really belongs to another era. You know, she's still an Edwardian, of course, and finds all the changes that younger people might have found exciting in that period. She finds them depressing and challenging and, yeah. So I like the fact that Frances is in that house with, that's this old, old house that needs continual dusting and cleaning and stuff like that. If she's, she's trying to keep up this life that she and her mother used to have with men folk around and with <coughs> servants and it's kind of a losing battle um, and then Lillian and Leonard move in and they're lower middle class on on the rise you know they've got a bit of money and their gramophone <coughs> and they're going out and they're having fun and I like that idea of that collision I suppose and what so it also because you were a big house of Elliot fan <laughs> oh house of Elliot <laughs> <laughs> well the, ha yeah. the house of idiot as uh, <laughs> Saunders did it um, I was a bit of a uh, House of Elliot fan, but not as big a fan as I am a Downton fan, and I'm still in mourning actually. <laughs> and then we've got the Christmas special still to come, haven't we? Yeah, but apart from that, to. are they gonna is Thomas gonna are they finally gonna match Thomas up with somebody? Do you think? I think uh, he's, surely. He's end up looking after one of the children. Is that kind of way of oh, saying is that all he's gonna get after him? all that? Oh. I think so. Um, anyway, <laughs> yeah. sorry. sorry, I've thrown you off yeah, there. Yeah, haven't yeah, I? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, that's what I, so you're talking about the cleaning and the, and, the, and the fact that you wanted 
Because a lot of the novels that we know of from that period, Bloomsbury Group, for example, it's very upper-class yeah. lives portrayed. And in this book, there is a lot of um, Francis having to come to terms with a, with a lower station in life. And, and there's a lot about the domestic chores of the time and the brights and the roughs. And, the, <laughs> uh, and, and, I, and I'm really interested to how you found that stuff out, because that isn't normally the recorded history. We don't, we don't get passed on... So where did you uncover that kind of stuff? Yeah, I knew, I began to realise quite early on that Francis would be doing a lot of housework. <laughs> and I'm not a natural housework doer myself, so I had to really use my imagination here. But I, I you know, I, <laughs> and of course Francis is, would have grown up with, with servants, that's, that's the thing, I suppose. Um, that suddenly she's having to do all this work that previously would have been almost invisible to her, I suppose, or, you know. So I looked at um, domestic encyclopedias were, were really useful books with titles like, you know, Inquire Inside, How Do You Clean Brass, How Do You Get Ink Stains Out of Calico, you know, all that yeah, kind of thing. Yeah. Um, newspapers, because, because of course this was a hot topic for the middle classes because they were, they, they couldn't afford, well this is happening in Downton as well, isn't it? You know, they couldn't afford the servants that they had been used to living with. <laughs> 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 um, so they had to find, you know, they had to either do their own housework or find ruses for not having to do it. And so there was a great series of articles in the Manchester Guardian, as it was in those days, the Guardian, um, you know, how to... And it was basically like, throw away antimacassars, you know, just throw anything away that's a dust trap, just kind of get rid of it, yeah. put a nice sheet of glass over the top of your dressing table. They said, which was interesting, because I'd thought of that as a kind of 50s thing yeah. for some reason. Put a nice sheet of glass of it, it's easier to keep it clean. Um, so it was a period in which people were talking about this stuff. But, um, yeah, I thought, yeah, Francis... And then, of course, it all fell into place for me because Francis is doing all this literal um, tidying up in the first half of the novel. And then things become, very, become morally very complicated and murky in the second half of the book. And she's kind of doing other kinds of... You know, she's desperately trying to make, keep things tidy and, and neat. So... It, the, yeah, there's a lot of mess in the book, I suppose. And the button. The button. Well, it, I was just thinking it comes. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of matter out of place, and, and what does that mean? And then, you know, to, to begin with, it's just a question of keeping up appearances, but then it becomes dangerous. If the yeah. wrong thing is in the wrong place in the second half of the book, that is yeah. seriously dangerous, you know. So, yeah, I enjoyed... And sometimes as a writer, you, can't, you don't see those things emerging until quite late on in the process and then you can really kind of enjoy them. Oh, yeah, you know, she is a fixer. Or she likes to think she's a fixer. And when she can't fix, the, when this problem gets too big and complicated for her to be able to fix, she kind of freaks out. So how much of the, in terms of the process, I think um, William Boyd said he writes, he researches for two years and then writes for a year. Mm. How much of the process for, I mean, and there's sort of about three or four years between your... A bit more, actually, because this took, this took I'm embarrassed to say, this took about four years to write, and that would have been after maybe a year of uh, publicity for the previous book, so I think there must, be, must have been about a six-year gap between the books. We were getting quite... <laughs> annoyed. We were kind of all sort of like, come on, when's the next <laughs> so, book? So, like, so was I. Answer, <laughs> it's too long a gap. Um, but so, so how long would you say you, you spend in preparation before you think, right, now I'm ready to yeah. sit down and start writing? I find that once I know what I'm looking for, research come, is very productive. So maybe, maybe, just, maybe three, three or four months pure research at the start, certainly nothing like William Boyd's two years. Because what I find happens to me is I begin to... Um, you know, characters and a plot begin to come to life for me. Um, they sort of come out of the research somehow. You know, they're characters who sort of represent issues that I'm interested in or something. Something happens. And then I'm kind of, kind of itching to, you know, bring them to life, really. Um, so I can do that when I get to a point with research where I feel I can... I've got my basic landscape. You know, I might not know. I remember writing some of the early scenes, and I didn't know what Frances was wearing. I didn't know what she should be wearing. Mm -hmm. and I didn't know what her underwear was, and I remember that being really unsettling. I felt I really needed to know that. But it, it didn't mean I couldn't start writing, because after all, you know, scenes aren't about underwear. I mean, I, some of them are, but most of them aren't. You know, they're about the dynamics of the people involved. They're about maybe a bit of conversation that's really telling or 
So I could write, you know, I could write a, the basics of a scene and then, but I keep researching for the whole life of the book, really. For me, it, they're very complementary activities. I can, if I run out of steam at the computer at four, you know, I can turn it off and then read um, for an hour or two. And, re you know, read, as I say, reading novels from a period which, which both give me the kind of mind of the period, but also sometimes give me nice little incidental details. Um, or diaries and letters, that, that was useful for this book. I mean, just published. Not, I'm not going through the archives. It's just published stuff. And newspapers were, were very, very good for the paying guests. And again, it's, you know, I was looking at the Times online, so I was sitting in an armchair. But it was fantastically useful to be looking. I could look at newspapers from the, from the actual days I was talking about, so I knew what the weather was like, you know, I knew what was on at the cinema, I knew what was in the news. I could see from the adverts what clothes were on sale in the shops and how much they cost. Um, and when it came to talking about things like crime, I could see how crimes were reported and what the process was. So I would say for this book, more than any of the others, newspapers were really, really good. So do you write in a linear, you, you write the story as it happens? Pretty or much. Do you, you have a really good scene and you write that scene, but then you go back because you... I like to save scenes. If I've, I, often there are scenes, I mean, if anyone's read this book, there's, there's a whole couple of chapters in the middle that are very... Um, meaty chapters and I, you know I knew they, I was working towards them and I didn't want to jump ahead I wanted to reward myself with those chapters when I felt like I you know deserved it by getting them with this book I wrote I, I worked a lot on the first half um, almost a bit too much really everybody kept saying to me my partner was saying just move on just move on and come back to it and I was like no no I'm nearly there just a few more months and of course what happened was when I then went when I then did write part two, it revealed things about the characters that I kind of thought, oh yeah, I should have realised that before, and then I had to go back and change it. So I won't do, I won't do that again. But the, the first half was the trickiest because it's, it's setting up the relationship between Francis and Lillian. And, you know, I realised very quickly that it had to be pretty slow because although Francis, as we discover, has had um, lesbian experiences in the past. Um, Lillian hasn't, and I really didn't want Lillian to have had that. I wanted her to be apparently, you know, heterosexual, um, married. She's from a relatively um, conventional sort of working class background. So it's, you know, I wanted her to be bowled over by Francis, and it had to be very tentative. It's 1922, you know, apart from anything else, it had to be, yeah. So you have returned to a a lesbian theme, I think that's not a giveaway anymore, yeah. that, that's part of this book after The Little Stranger which mm. didn't have a although we had suspicions about the character in the book, <laughs> there wasn't anything explicit in that book that was lesbian and it was a male narrator that's right. as, as well which that's I think right. is the, your, uh, the only book that you've written with a male yeah. protagonist male narrator, yeah um, do you feel obligated to be the lesbian novelist? <laughs> um, no, no, I don't. I, um, it was very... I, I couldn't have written A Little Stranger any other way. You know, it came to me. I've, I love the Gothic. I, um, I've always liked ghost stories and haunted house stories, and suddenly I had this opportunity to write a haunted house book, and I really went for it and really enjoyed it. And I just knew right from the beginning it wasn't going to be a gay a lesbian story and I, I you know I couldn't even I could have shoehorned in a lesbian character or something and I <laughs> I didn't even want to do that I wanted it to be organic if it was going to be anything at all and there is a, ca a character Caroline the daughter of the house who's a bit butch and some people have read as possibly lesbian or a repressed lesbian but actually I never even considered Caroline and somebody once said to me oh she's not gay she's an awkward heterosexual she said and I thought that was <laughs> that was a good way of putting it um, <coughs> so um so in a funny sort of way, it was quite liberating to write The Little Stranger and think, oh, I can write a book that doesn't have lesbians in. That's all right. So it was all right with me anyway. I mean, some of my lesbian readers were quite cross with me. I know they were. <laughs> but, you know, what can you do? But, but with this book, I really... It was right there, like I was saying, you know, when I thought about a case like Edith Thompson's or Alma Rattenbury's, what, what really interested me was, was thinking, OK, that's very heterosexual, but, but yeah, OK, what would it be like? if this had a lesbian element. So it was right there at the core of the book. And I really enjoyed, um, I really enjoyed the fact that it is a love, a love story. It's about their relationship, Francis and Lillian, and I felt very close to them. And um, even though it's, 
it was a tiring book to write in all sorts of ways, but I was very sorry to, to say goodbye to them, really, very mm. attached to them. And that would lead me on to a question that I can't ask because it would give away the end of the book and we're not allowed to give away <laughs> the end of the book. Um, so, not referring to the paying guests, there aren't a lot of happy endings. There aren't many, are there? They sort of alternate because Tipping is and Fingersmith is, mm. and then it, but then I, then I did The Little Stranger. Um, I think there are about half and half, aren't the there? Night Watch was really Oh, that's really bleak. Yeah. That's like cut your wrists bleak, it isn't is. it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's made worse by that narrative thing you did it backwards first. So you can't even, God, does it get any better? Because you're going backwards. So you know that as bad as it was at the beginning is yeah. how it will be at the end. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> but that was, a, you know, that for me, that book was, a, again, I suppose that was about the failure of love, which I'd sort of thought this might be. Um, be yeah, because we, we meet the relationships when they've all gone sour and then we follow them back to that lovely moment when they're just beginning. It's a very, very poignant way of writing about relationships when you go back like that. Um, I know, I do like a bleak ending, but what can you do? I'm not, saying, I'm not saying anything about this book, though. No, I'm not saying anything about this book. <laughs> Um, but I, I mean, I think it's. I think it says something that there are still so few uh, good literary lesbian writers out there that <coughs> people look to you and, and and anticipate your books because they want that really good piece of literature that happens to have lesbian characters at the heart of it. Um, and here we are in two thousand and fifteen, and and. Well, it's not as rare as it used to be, is it? You know, I mean, when I started, when I was young and coming out in my 20s, say, so that was like the 80s and early 90s, um, there was loads of lesbian and gay writing around. And actually, and I was going to say, you know, it was not all great, was it? It was not all very inspiring. Fiction, detective fiction. And there yeah. were, but, you know, there was some good stuff around. There was, there was lots of lesbian sci-fi around, and some of that was actually really interesting. Um... There was, there was lesbian detective fiction, which I was a bit less drawn to. There was some good lesbian historical fiction around. Patience and Sarah, do you know that? Isabel mm. Miller, <coughs> actually from the 70s, that book. Yeah. Fab fabulous book. Um, Ellen Galford, Mole Cut Purse. There was a bar in Manchester, and there was, it was a lesbian bar, and there was a Patience and Sarah toilet, where <laughs> you could judge who, which, which oh, toilet that's nice. you went to. That's really nice. <laughs> um, yeah, Ellen Galford, who wrote... Um, Mole Cut Purse, does anyone remember that? And um, Fires of Bride. Um, there were some good lesbian writers about, and I think it's sad that, I think if they were writing now, actually they'd, they'd easily cross over into, a, you know, into the mainstream. Yeah. But um, this was a time when lesbian fiction was being published by small lesbian presses on the whole, wasn't it? And kept, sort of which kept it very much within the community, and which I remember being politically very exciting. I was very, very happy to be reading books published by Only Women and Silver Moon and yeah. Sheba and the loads of them, you know, weren't there? Virago, you know, we're doing more like Nyad that kind of States. women's press. Nyad. They're um, a particular sort. Uh, yeah. Though even Nyad, Nyad had, some, had some good titles. Um, so, you know, we can't, we can't say it's like that anymore. There is, there is good, uh, you know, it feels like there's, there's good lesbian fiction around and we, there's good... I mean, there's Orange is the New Black. I know it's easy, you just think, oh, well, it's, but, well, what else is there? But it seems to me that younger lesbians now, they only have to turn on the internet and there, there just seems to be so much more affirmation of yeah. lesbian life and love and whatever than was available to us, don't you think? <coughs> I don't know. I, I, don't, I, don't find I, I don't find many other writers that I consider of the quality of your writing that have lesbian characters in the in the centre of the in the book. I, I still couldn't. But then again, it amazes me how many lesbian writers um, are, you know, really really good, really celebrated writers right in the mainstream. I mean, Carol Ann Duffy is the poet laureate. Yeah, you yeah. know, Jackie Kay, Ali Smith, yeah. Val McDermott, um, Stella Duffy, Charlotte Mendelssohn, Joanna Briscoe. I mean, there's a lot. There's a lot of names there, and they're mm. all writers who have who have got real considerable mainstream success as well as as well as lesbian success. I think that's quite extraordinary, don't you, don't you think so? Yeah. You beat Val McDermott in the sun with life. <laughs> I don't think we should talk about beating. <laughs> I don't think it's... <laughs> <laughs> it's not very collegiate. <laughs> um, 
Um, I wonder, so do you, do you consider yourself a political writer? Well, I mean, for all the reasons we've been talking about, I can't, um, of course... Oh, Jeanette Winston, of course, I should mention as well. He was a big, very inspiring writer for me. Yeah. Um, Emma Donoghue, I know she, we can't claim her as British, especially not now she lives in Canada. Well, yeah. we never could, but you know what I mean? Yeah. I felt like she was part of... It. But, yeah, Jeanette Winston, I remember... Um, of course, I remember Orange is Not the Only Fruit, but the book actually that made a huge impression on me was The Passion. Yeah. And part of the reason it made a big impression on me was because I, it was published by Penguin, and I remember picking it up and thinking this is a proper literary book with a penguin on the spine and it's a it's a lesbian novel and yeah. that was a real yeah. uh, that seemed amazing to me that you know that she just seemed Jeanette Winston just seemed to come from nowhere and just sh you know show that lesbian fiction didn't have to be this small sort of genre fiction published in a rather naff cover you know it could be something really ambitious and literary um, so yeah so I was, so yes I mean obviously I know that lesbian writing does, continues to have a kind of political charge to it. Um, and so... But, but you, never, you never set out to make an explicitly well, political... No, I don't have that kind of agenda, but at the same time, I do kind of have a lesbian agenda, of course, because I'm interested in lesbian stories, and I think any, every story is, is political because you're, you're making a point about what's worth what stories are worth telling, you know, what stories are worth saving, what stories are worth recovering, or what stories are worth inventing and claiming. Um, and, of course, we don't always see, we don't see women's lives, you know, the history of housework, you're right, we don't see that represented. It's how most of women have spent their time for huge chunks of history. Um, and we don't always see, you know, lesbian and gay life represented with respect and with care. So, of course, I'm aware that I like to think that, I, that that's what I'm doing, is sort of take, telling lesbian stories in a way that puts, puts lesbians at the heart of, the, of a narrative, you know, not on the edges of somebody else's narrative, but right there in a narrative that's, that's, that's big, too, that isn't just, isn't just a lesbian story. You yeah. know, it's, it's, a, it's, a big, it's a big story. It's a story about moral dilemma and... Um, or it might be about <coughs> loss and betrayal or desire or guilt or any of those things, you know, that we're used to seeing attached to heterosexual stories. Um, but, that you know, but they, they can belong to lesbian gay stories too. Um, when you were doing the research, we were chatting before and I said, uh, we had Diana Swami here as part of a Polari event for, for Homotopia last week. And um, she was referring to her book about the trials of Radcliffe Hall, and she was talking about Vita and Violet and Virginia, and uh, and I was thinking, God, I really don't know that many um, women who wrote about <coughs> this experience in the early twentieth century or the nineteenth century. Mm. In your research, have you have you uncovered many unsung? Lesbian I'd love to say I'd found some, you know, forgotten lesbian classics. Um, I haven't. I um, mean, I knew all about, obviously, Viol you know, Violet Vita, Virginia, Radcliffe Hall. Um, Sylvia Townsend Warner was, has always been a great literary her hero of mine, partly because of her politics, left-wing politics. Um, so I knew about them already. I think what I think I was surprised by some of the... Like Daphne du Maurier, for example, I knew had had lesbian love affairs, really significant ones. Um, I didn't know that both her sisters had as well. There's a biography called... Daphne du Maurier and Her Sisters by Jane Dunn that came out a year or two ago. And, um, you know, one of Daphne du Maurier's sisters is, was uh, what we would call a lesbian, I think. You know, she just seemed to realise as a teenager that she was attracted to women, had affairs with women, set, um, set up house with, with, a, with a woman lover for, you know, most of her life. And, and then the other sister, too, had some relationships with men, but mainly, you know, her significant romantic relationships were with women. Um, I knew that Catherine Mansfield was a bit of a swinger, but I didn't know that she'd had, you know, several significant lesbian affairs or relationships too. Um, so it was things like that, I think, that kind of surprised me. Um, you know, the, the extent to which, the ease, I suppose, with which um, women could find lesbian partners and could enter into lesbian relationships. And I know all the, all the women we've named are were middle class or arty, yeah. you know. Um, but then there are things like, do you know, the Bob, and this was a bit later really, but Barbara Bell's um, memoir, Just Take Your Frock Off. Do you know that? <laughs> oh yeah, it's a great book. Just Take Your Frock Off, it's called. And the Barbara Bell was, grew, was born, I think, in 1914. 
um, to a working class Lancashire family. She had her first lesbian experience when she was 14. She was kind of introduced by a friendly older woman. Um, uh, that sounds a bit creepy, doesn't it? But it's, 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 best, it's, it's nicer when you read it. Um, <laughs> so that was in 1928, the year of the Well of Loneliness, but on a completely different, in a completely different walk of life, you know, from the sort of posh Radcliffe Halls of the world. And yet there, there it was all going on ahead. And then she had sort of lesbian affairs and relationships forever after. There's a fantastic letter to Edward Carpenter. Does anyone know this letter from a woman who called herself Frances Wilder? It's a, it's a letter that's in the... Edward Carpenter was a, you know, he was a writer on sexual and political matters. Gay himself, he lived quite openly with his working class lover, George Merrill in Sheffield. And he received lots of letters and, and visits from fans. And um, there's this one letter, and it, there's, a, there's a great book uh, published by, um, edited by Alison Oram, who's a friend of mine, and uh, Anne-Marie Turnbull. And it's called The Lesbian History Sourcebook, I think. And it's full of, full of snippets, and it contains this letter that a woman calling herself Frances Wilder, I would guess, lower middle class woman, she'd read one of his books about homosexuality and wrote to him to say, I think I might be the kind of person you're talking about. And she talks about her, she's been in love with women, she's got a woman friend she's in love with, but she doesn't like. She's in touch with two women living together in Scotland. And it's clear that she's talking about sexual relationships, not just sort of romantic friendships. And, you know, this is just a kind of glimpse of the sort of life that um, we don't hear about, you know, no. and there it was all going on. That's why we need you to write these books. Because <laughs> they don't exist in the original form, so we need somebody to fill in all of those. But the thing is, the, kind of the information is sort of there, all these things I've mentioned, and yet it's still not popularly known, you know. So I think it's, it's interesting that we almost resist it. I don't know, it's funny that it hasn't changed the way we think about the past, I think. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe. Mm. Um, How are we doing? Sorry, I'm just conscious of, yeah. Ooh, of time Maybe now. we should... Um, yeah, maybe we should uh, throw it open to <coughs> the floor and ask if um, people in the audience would like to ask Sarah some questions. If nobody wants to, we'll carry on. Together. Oh, here's <laughs> one. Um, Hi. Um, Have I ever been interested in writing a factual book? I haven't, actually. I think um, I did a PhD thesis about a billion years ago that was sort of a bit about lesbian and gay history. And um, I, loved, I loved writing it, but once I, you know, I moved from there to writing fiction with Tipping the Velvet, and once I made that move to writing fiction, it was such bliss to be able to just make things up, really, that I've never really wanted to go back to non-fiction. Um, I can see the appeal of it, but it's something about stories, you know. I just love storytelling and the way it can... And, I think, and of course, the thing is, I think, you know, s storytelling is a... Fiction writing, I think, can be a really... Uh, a, re a resource, you know, kind of like a political resource, I suppose you're talking about. Um, because in a funny sort of way, because there's so much we don't know about lesbian and gay history that for, an, for a historian that's frustrating you know there's only so much you can tell but for a novelist it's actually really liberating it's kind of gives you a license to make things up really I think as long as you do it sensitively and try and capture the difference of the past you know it's no good just putting modern lesbian and gay people in the past that's not how it works that's not what it was like it, um, the, the appeal of the past for me is that it was a different it was a different world and sexuality, heterosexuality as well as homosexuality was experienced and enacted in, in different ways. You know, that for me is the, the excitement of writing historical fiction, really. Mm. Yes? Are we interested in what you were saying about the unknowable? And um, I wonder as a writer, how do you get the balance between telling stories and just leaving some things unknown? Did everyone, would you like me to repeat that or did you hear that yeah. okay? You did hear it, or you'd like me to repeat it? Yes. <laughs> um, that's very interesting, isn't it? And it's one of those things you have to learn, I suppose, as a writer. I think a lot of it has to be instinctive or something. And, of course, we all tell stories all the time, and we're always making decisions about what to, what to, how much to tell and how much to leave out. And people who haven't got that facility of being able to leave stuff out you know, are terrible bores, and you avoid talking to them at <laughs> party. <laughs> but most of us, hopefully me too, are our skill because that's what social interaction is all about is how much information to release and how much to withhold so I think we actually all have it very naturally and writing a novel is just 
putting those skills at the service of, of something else, really. But it's quite difficult to judge that when you're writing a book. I mean, I mean, I remember writing, when I was writing The Little Stranger, which is a ghost story, and I was really hoping to frighten people at times. It's very hard to judge if, you're, if it's frightening or not, because you're right there. You know, you can see, you're like the guy in The Wizard of Oz pulling all the levers. You're, you're pulling the levers. You don't know what's on the other side of the curtain. You can't judge the effect of it. Um, but then trying it out on, on readers is crucial there. So I'll often try early drafts out on readers. But I think it does have to be um, a skill you either, uh, yeah, you, you hone. I put, put it like that. I think we've all got it. But I think as a novelist, you, that's what you're doing. You're honing those sorts of skills, hopefully. And you said, I think, <coughs> I was thinking about, we haven't talked about Tipping the Velvet and the fact that the play has, has mm. you said, just gone to Edinburgh, I think. And it's just about to finish. was yeah. in London and... And um, when people work on screenplays of your novels as well previously, the, the experience of seeing a 500 pages of novel translated to 90 pages yeah. of dialogue or whatever, all that's left out. I mean, all, all of that narrative has been left out and it's just been reduced to... Is that, is that quite a sobering experience in terms of... It was. I remember the first time seeing tipping the, the screenplay of Tipping the Velvet, which was as, exactly as you say... 90 pages are very sparse. Have you ever seen a screenplay laid out? You know, it's very sparse. I'm thinking, oh my God, where's my book? But of course, so much of your book is, you know, what they're wearing and what the weather is and um, what they can hear. And of course, that's all supplied by the costume department and the weather department and the sound department. You know, it's very it's fascinating seeing that happen. And really, a screenplay is about the <coughs> essence of the story. And it was, it's been very, it's been a real education for me, I think, to see screenplays. It's made me reflect about... So maybe reflect on what what the essence of a story is. I mean, God, you wouldn't know it. Look at the size of that. But I mean, I always try and think now about what's really at the heart of this one scene, and it might be just one exchange, you know, just one piece of dialogue that what is is what the scene is all about. Yeah. But you've not been tempted to move into different forms yourself, mm. like, for example, write a play yourself. I did do. I did co-write a show, as I prefer to call it, rather than a play, last year uh, called The Frozen Scream with um, my friend Christopher Green which was absolutely joyous from start to finish. It wasn't entirely successful, um, but things, things about it really did work. It, that was at Cardiff and Birmingham. It was a spooky Christmas show, basically, and it was partly a, um, a straightforward narrative like, uh, that then broke down and it became Im uh, immersive. We took the audience around, and it was fascinating for me to think about constructing a narrative experience in a different way from the page, because, of course, at the, in the, on the page, you're really in control, you know, Everybody's looking here. You know, your, your reader is sort of following your cues the whole time. Whereas you've got a crowd of people. Everybody's looking in a different direction. You know, how do you get them all experiencing the right narrative cues at the right time? So I really enjoyed thinking about that. But I've never... No, I wouldn't be tempted to do it more seriously, I think, because it is so different. Creating a... Um, I mean, I think film... I think screenplays actually are closer to novels than plays are. I think plays are just, a, a, you know, creating a, a theatrical effect is it's just a very, very different thing from creating an effect on the page. I think it just needs a different mind to be able to see it from many different angles. Whereas, and of course there is that thing an audience can all be looking at in a different direction, whereas in a film what you've got very similar techniques to, to a novel. You've got close-ups and you've got long shots and you've got montages, you've got time passing very quickly, you've got time slowing right down. You can direct your audiences in a pretty similar way, I think, to the way you can direct them with a novel. So would you be tempted to do a screenplay mm. of one of your... No, having said all that, um, <laughs> I, find them, I, find, I love watching films and thinking about how they work as narratives. Um, but, and I can see intellectually it would be interesting to try a screenplay. But I think adapting your own is... As some, uh, a writer friend said it's like performing surgery on your children. You know, it's you have to be really ruthless. Although I have just seen Room, which is you know the Emma Donoghue novel, has just been made into a film, and Emma herself did the screenplay, and it's really really good. Really? It's fantastically good. Yeah. So um, author, authors can do it, but I would be wary of doing it myself. I'd almost rather try try it on somebody else, you know, try adapting somebody yeah. else's book because you need that dispassion. I yeah. think. Any more questions? There's a lady at the back. How much involvement did you have personally in your adaptation of your books for film for the um, None, really, and certainly none creatively. Um, I would... Uh, I mean, 
the process would start with me being approached by a production company, talking through what, what they liked about the book and what they thought they could do with it. So obviously at that point I'd have to feel uh, I liked what they were saying, that they weren't going to kind of, you know, introduce a flying saucer or something like that, you know, that they were going to... And then what usually happens is then they get a director on board and again I would meet with the director and talk it through and, and then the script writers and the things. So I sort of have this exposure um, to the process and the kind of inclusion in the process. And then I would usually see a draft or two of, of a screenplay. And then, but at, at that point, if, if I do give feedback, I don't really feel it's my place to give kind of creative feedback. So I might just give points, historical accuracy or something like that, you know. Um, yeah, so from that point onwards, I'm just an observer, really. And it's been, with all the adaptations, it's been um, a great experience just to, just to be involved. It's such a different medium it's such a different industry it works in such a different kind of way it's so busy and compared to writing a novel which is so silent and solitary and uh, oppressive at times it can be joyous but it can be like oh my god i heard it's been on the radio the other morning did anybody else hear him talk because brooklyn has just been adapted hasn't it and he was saying you know you know the burden of having to write the next sentence no only you can do it whereas um, I mean, uh, you know, any writer, screenplay writer has that, and yet then they, they, they take it and it becomes this collaborative experience. It's the same in theatre too, having just seen Tipping the Velvet adapted for the stage. <coughs> it was just such good fun because it's alive in, in every way. The whole process is alive, and night by night it's alive. So I found myself going. I was like a Tipping the Velvet groupie or something. It was embarrassing. <laughs> I just couldn't keep away. I went with different friends at different times, but because it was just slightly different. Every single night the audience was different, and that made the performance is slightly different and the, the beats would fall in a slightly different place and I just it's so different from a novel which is just there it is you know and it's all that happens while you're writing it but then there it is and it never changes and of course it's different for everybody who reads it and it's different when you read a book it can be very different at, in your, at different times in your life can't it but it hasn't got that life that, that aliveness that uh, so you became now I did. I've been yeah, yeah, what, waiting for the rest. Yeah. It's true. I kind of did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did a bit. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Um, you did like a, a modern novel, and if so, what aspects of modern life did you did you be interested in? Um, would I write a, 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 a novel with a modern setting? I've never been really pulled to that yet. Like I was talking about the things I like about writing about the past, and they do always draw me into, back into the past. Um, I did really enjoy writing a ghost story for The Little Stranger. It's really a poltergeist story, but anyway, a ghost story. Um, and, I, and I often thought while I was doing that it would be interesting to try and write a, a, a ghost story with a contemporary setting. Because in a, you, know, it's, you get a creepy old house in the 1940s and the lights are flickering and the phone line's dead because of the snow and it's relatively easy to conjure up a spooky atmosphere. But you know, you've got a kind of an sort of fluorescent lit kind of modern setting and it's much more of a challenge. I think it would be a really interesting challenge. So that's something that's in the back of my mind, but um, not, not just yet. Yeah. <coughs> um, I've just started a master's in history and it was Tipping the Velvet that really got me interested in male, male impersonation and looking at um, presenting trans identity. Um, so my dissertation is looking at um, 19th century female husbands and I was mm. looking at For me, as a writer, no, I suppose. I mean, Tipping the Velvet of all my books is the one that is most interested in gender as performance and the fluidity of gender and that kind of thing. Um, and male impersonation in the musical, I mean, it's such a fascinating thing. You know, it's for me, it was hard not to look at those. This was when I started thinking about it, you know, it was in the 90s, and I'd look at images of those male impersonators, Vesta Tilly and Hetty King, with their impeccable kind of outfits. And they looked like drag kings. You know, this was a big time for drag kings. And it was really difficult not to give a lesbian interpretation of them. But, um, but yeah, now, you know, you, you might want to give a trans interpretation. Or, or are, you know, were they something just completely different? You know, some, something of their own. I mean, they were part of mainstream entertainment. I think that's what interested me about them, really. There they were at the heart of mainstream entertainment, Victorian and Edwardian. But I think for some people in the audience, there would be this extra erotic charge, you know. Um, and I like the idea that some they, they could be read in very different ways, male impersonators, and that they might have enjoyed that, and they might have had some kinds of fans who were a bit different from other kinds of fans, you know. 
<laughs> do you remember, do you know, Taka, is it Takarazuka, the, the Japanese um, girls who dress as men? I remember going to see them, and apparently they have lots and lots of, of young female fans who are like, you know, really kind of in love with them. And I think it's a sort of similar kind of charge, really. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, I think women passing as men in any era is often one of the few um, traces we have of, of kind of queer life, you know, however you want to label it, because it, if, if women were discovered or if they were arrested or put on, you know, trial for passing as men, it left that mark on the historical record that, that lesbianism and other kinds of queer female life just didn't, wasn't able to leave because lesbianism wasn't, you know, hasn't been um, illegal in the UK um, in the way that, that, that male homosexuality, homosexuality has been. So it's, yeah, it's one of those very, very tantalising um, traces, I think. Yeah, well, yeah, that's fascinating. Good luck with your thesis. Um, I'm conscious of the, yes. of the time now, and uh, Sarah has uh, agreed to, to do a signing, and News From Nowhere, I hope, have set up a <coughs> stall in the bar. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, if people would like to uh, get the book signed in the bar, um, we'll do that. Yeah. If that's okay, so Great. we'll be out there in a couple of minutes. Yeah, sure. Thank you very Thank much. You. For